Whoa. No. There. Sorry. Right. Right, we'll start again. Good morning. I'm Rosemary Bonkowski, the chairperson of um, the Canterbury and West Coast Division of the Neurological Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you all to Brain Day uh, Christchurch, which is part of 2013 Brain Awareness Week New Zealand, um, and we're proudly sponsored by the Neurological Foundation. Last year, the Neurological Foundation uh, celebrated 40 years of funding neurological research in New Zealand. In 1972, not long after the formation of the foundation, five neurological research projects were approved of, at a cost of $28,200. Now, I don't know what that is in today's money, but not very much. In 2012, the foundation reached an astonishing annual contribution of $2 million in funding to neurological research projects and we're thrilled to have funded over 50 funded projects across New Zealand currently. Through this funding the foundation continues to make an impact on the progress of research into devastating disorders such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and Huntington's disease, uh, stroke, epilepsy, migraine, brain cancer, motor neurone disease, muscular dystrophy and many many more. And this will affect, these will affect one in five New Zealanders during their lifetime. It has only been through the generosity of the Foundation supporters and bequesters that this achievement has been po uh, possible. So thank you all very much. Today's event is supported by the New Zealand Brain Research Institute, based here in Christchurch. Together we're thrilled to present an insightful lineup of lectures and seminars that we're sure will leave you inspired with, and with a greater understanding of the incredible research work being carried out in laboratories and clinics in this country. Now just before I introduce John, I'd just like to mention that in the foyer after the lecture, if you register for the book draw, you can go into the draw to win three cop uh, well, there's three copies to be one of The Power of Us, which is a book about many famous New Zealanders um, and includes Richard Fall, who's the director of the Brain Institute in um, Auckland. And I'd also just like to mention that in the foyer, there are the, all the support groups for the various societies, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, if you'd like to look at those in between speakers and for our physical comforts is the naked baker who's not uh, naked he's outside with uh, muffins coffee whatever um, just to sustain you during the day now down to business our first key speaker of today's exciting lineup is neurologist dr S uh, john simcock with brain disorders progress and prospects Dr. John Simcock has enjoyed a long and distinguished career as a neurologist. He was born in Dunedin, educated at New Plymouth Boys High School and graduated from the Otago School of Medicine in 1960. He became a member of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians in 1964 and completed his specialist training as a neurologist at the National Hospital for Nervous Diseases, Queen's Square, London in 1968. He then took up a position at Auckland Hospital, also conducting urology clinics at Northland and Taranaki Base Hospitals. He retired from his full-time public hospital positions in 2002, but continued in private practice and occasional uh, temporary duties at various hospitals in the North Island until recently. Dr Simcock has been the Foundation's medical advisor since 1994. Today, Dr. Simcock will speak about the latest progress in the understanding of brain disorders. He will also discuss how the 21st century has introduced exciting new neurological investigation techniques, paving the way for enhanced diagnosis and treatment. And I'd like you to please give a warm welcome to Dr. Simcock. Thank you, for Rosemary, for that uh, splendid introduction. It's all true. She could have mentioned some things because as the wife of a neurosurgeon with whom I worked in Auckland, she has some insights which are better not mentioned in public. But welcome to Brain Day. The brain is intensely interesting. And my fascination with the brain be began in 1957, when I took a year out from the medical course to do a year's neurophysiological research 
on the brains of toads. Toads are those flat things that you see on the road in Queensland. Um, but then I continued with neurology and uh, finished my neurology training in London, returning to Auckland in 1968, and since then have been in neurological practice. So I can look back over 45 years as a neurologist, and it has been an exciting 45 years, and I wish, only wish there were another 45 to go. Um, my contact with Christchurch has been a little remote, but in the end of 2010, I started doing a few days a week, a few days each month, doing clinics for Tim Anderson while he was on um, sabbatical leave. And that was exciting because I happened to be doing a clinic at the Van der Veer Institute in February two years ago when you turned on the most eventful day I can remember. Um, also, the other contact with Christchurch is that both our sons now live here, and it is a real bonus to have the opportunity to visit them and their families, as well as speaking here today. Now, my talk is going to be in three parts. Firstly, I'm going to talk a little about the neurological foundation, and secondly, I'm going to then talk about what has happened in neurology over the 45 years of my experience in the field, and finally then say, well, what's likely to happen in the future? Now, the Neurological Foundation has the mission statement to alleviate suffering of disorders of the brain and nervous system through research and education. I'll talk about the research and education sides in a minute or two. But I'd like to mention these three chairs in neurology. Professor Alan Barber, who started his neuro neurology training here, is now the New Zealand Neurological Foundation Professor of Clinical Neurology in Auckland, and the funds were ra raised by the foundation, and he took up his appointment nearly five years ago. This is, was, has been a very successful appointment, and you probably know that the uh, a similar professor in Dunedin has been appointed, but in neurosurgery, and Dirk de Ridder has started work down there in the past few weeks. And we now have the next big move is to raise funds for a professor of neurosurgery in Auckland. Christchurch has been really very well endowed to have the Van der Veer Inst Institute and to have Professor Tim Anderson heading a remarkably active uh, research team in Parkinson's disease. Now the research funding has been mentioned by Rosemary as going up to two million dollars last year. Uh, this involves small project grants and these are really just grants if someone has a, a researcher has an idea, they want to see whether it's practical to go ahead and continue with this work for the next three years. And then if that uh, works out well for them, then they apply for a project grant. And we get applications for about 20 project grants each year. And these vary from eighty to two hundred thousand dollars but that's spread over three years and it's intensely competitive. The first step is by the uh, Foundation Scientific Advisory Committee and they rank each project in order of whether it needs to be um, funded or not. 
and about one third do not really come up to the high level expected by the foundation. Of the remaining two thirds, only about a half can be funded so that there is intense pressure on the funds and the projects that are funded are really of a very high order. So you can rest assured that the money that you contribute to the foundation goes to very worthwhile projects. Travel grants don't need much explanation. The brain bank, neurological brain bank, is very important and that's requiring increasing funds. It's been an extraordinary journey and 145 people and their families have donated the brain of someone with a neurological disorder to the brain bank and this has provided invaluable, absolutely invaluable uh, resource for people in research and parts of those brains are in fact sent overseas to collaborators overseas. So that's extraordinarily uh, successful and interesting, well organised and uh, I think we're, we're very proud to be associated with that. The scholarships are an interesting uh, aspect for me because I'm on the interviewing panel for these and it's extraordinary to see now how the very, some of the very best students are going into neuroscience and when they are at the uh, Miller postgraduate, when they're doing a PhD, they would much rather have a Miller fellowship on their CV than a university scholarship. So that again is an indication of how well the foundation is regarded. And so scholarships then take them from their honours degree through their PhD, they have postdoc fellowship usually overseas, and we've found that overseas people tend to grab our very good, very good people. So we've got a repatriation fellowship so that we can say, we'll bring you back, we'll get you started, and then you can, if you are up to expectations, you'll continue in your neuroscience in New Zealand. Then separate from these are the neuroscience people, separate are the, uh, is the fellowship for medical graduates. And uh, one of these Chapman Fellows was John Fink, and he did um, his year over in Boston and researched in stroke. And together with Alan Barber, who also started his neurology here, they formed stroke units in Auckland, Christchurch, and then had the uh, uh, mission to set, get stroke units set up at all major hospitals. So the Chapman Fellows have contributed in all sorts of ways. For example, the, Dr Barry Snow became chairman of our scientific advisory committee, and then Professor John Reynolds took over from Barry last year. So these people get a lot, they get a substantial scholarship, but on the other hand, they come back and contribute significantly, not only to the foundation, but to health in New Zealand. The uh, foundation, very briefly, has got a basically lay council of 13 people. There are um, two, a neurosurgeon and a neurologist on that. Executive Director Max Ritchie, that's me. The Scientific Secretary is a very busy person putting together all these research project grant applications and getting referees reports on them. The office staff have increased to seven and uh, we are very proud to have a powerful team of community liaison on bequest officers and uh, particularly um, having Cecilia Pascoe and Brian Hanrahan here. My association with Cecilia goes back many years and we've had some um, very interesting talks over the years. Now, 
<clears throat> the progress in neurology over the last 45 years has been extraordinary, and I can only pick out a few aspects of it. From the basic science point of view, the most impressive part has been the development of genetics and molecular biology. And uh, the knowledge that has increased in neurodegenerative disorders. And Bronwyn Connor will talk about this in the second talk, so I don't need to mention those in any detail. Uh, multiple sclerosis and immun the immunology of the nervous system, I'll only speak from a rather superficial level because Debbie Mason is going to be talking about that later in the day. Um, the most striking change from the point of view of the patient has been in neuroimaging. So a lot of my talk will be some slides which explain all about neuroimaging. The genetic side of it, I'd like to talk to you about a patient, very special to me because I first met her when I was a medical registrar and she was aged 17 in the psychiatric ward at Auckland Hospital. And so I was a registrar, the senior neurologist recognised that she had a very unusual disorder. And his comment was, she is a very good example of the condition from which he, she suffers. But we didn't know what it was. And the reason that we didn't know what it was, because there was no description in the English literature until 1977. But he did recognise her problem, in fact, was that as the day wore on, she got increasing difficulty with walking, so that she had a very, very difficult gait. She couldn't run, and her reaction to this, as happens in teenagers, was to have behavioural problems, and that's why she was in the psychiatric unit. Um, Dr. Glasgow recognised that she had a neurological problem, and the, uh, he treated her with Dysipal, which was used for Parkinson's disease, and she improved significantly. And then, in 1972, Cinemet became available, and I was looking after her, and Cinemet is used in Parkinson's, it contains L-DOPA, and this disorder was then described as L-DOPA responsive dystonia. And she started that in 1972, and I now keep in touch with her, and she's been normal since then. Just fantastic. And it's a rare disorder, it's, and then of course, we knew very little about it. We knew it occurred in families. But the genetics was sorted out. And in 1994, it was shown to be due to a defect in a single gene. The mutations could be of different mutations in different families. And in 2009, we got the genetic test done in Melbourne and showed what the specific mutation was in her family. And uh, she referred to it. Most of her family had a, an unusual presentation of it. They had, a, had an essential, what looked like an essential tremor. She had the typical presentation, and some of them have sort of Parkinson's disease type symptoms. And um, she said, by gosh, it's good to be rid of the curse of the Drummonds. And uh, so there it is. Over my professional lifetime, we've learnt what the disorder is, we've found the cause of it, and we've got a specific treatment. And uh, as I said, she is, remains normal, continuing to take her medication. Now, turning to immunology, um, I'm not really going to say much about MS at all, um, but we've come to realise that MS is not really a uniform disorder. 
Um, it's got all sorts of subtypes within it. And one group of patients that we recognized as being a bit different because they got trouble restricted to the optic nerves and the spinal cord. They didn't get problems in any other part of the nervous system. And they got attacks and remissions, just like patients with MS. But then in 2004, it was found that these people had antibodies to aquaporin, which is a component of the cell membrane, and the aquaporin is, uh, receptors are concentrated in particular parts of the brain, and that these antibodies um, are then are associated with this disorder. So it became quite separate with different treatment from MS. And this has been the pattern over the years, what we sort of tend to think of as one disorder. In amongst it are special groups, which are quite different. And narcolepsy, when I was a student, you know, it was fascinating to hear about narcolepsy, because these people would, uh, it would narcolepsy generally come on, say, in the 20s, and characteristically, people would have this irresistible urge to go to sleep, have a sleep for three or four minutes, the batteries be recharged and they'd be all right. But this would happen at inappropriate times, such as at meals and at meetings, and I don't see anyone with narcolepsy here. Um, but the narcolepsy was associated with odd things, hallucinations just on going off to sleep or waking up or sleep paralysis where they'd wake up and be quite unable to move and then suddenly after a few minutes they'd be able to move perfectly well, so sleep paralysis. But the other thing was cataplexy and cataplexy is the giving way of the muscles when you're standing. You know, the expression, he laughed so much he fell down. That's what cataplexy is. With any emotion or with um, particularly laughing, the knees give way and the patient falls to the ground. And interestingly, you know, I saw a patient who said that, you know, doctor, when other people tell a joke, I can stand up all right, but when I tell a joke, I've got to sit down. <laughs> and another patient who shared an interest of mine, which was duck shooting, He'd be there, 6.30 a.m., first morning, first Saturday morning of May, light coming up, and then the ducks, <laughs> ducks, where are they? And then, you know, as soon as a duck came in range and he lifted his gun, he'd collapse to the floor of the Mai Mai. So he had to shoot sitting down. And the other thing that happened to him was that when he got angry with the children and raised his hand in anger, he'd collapse to the ground. And his children thought was this, this was great. So they'd really wind him up on occasions just to see the reaction. So there it was, a very, now we had no idea what this could possibly be. Um, some people suggested it was a variant of epilepsy and other things. But it turns out that there are antibodies to these orexin-producing cells in the lateral hypothalamus, the base of the brain, which is sort of the integrating part for sleep and also the maintenance of tone in the muscles. So it all fits together when you know what it is. But, you know, there it was until um, 10 years ago, we really had no idea what the cause of narcolepsy was, and it turns out to be an autoimmune disorder. Now, the first autoimmune disorder that I came across uh, with regard to neurology was myasthenia gravis. And uh, I saw a very attractive Rarotong uh, Rarotongan girl in the medical ward at Auckland Hospital, and she had droopy eyelids and she had myasthenia gravis, and she also had thyrotoxicosis, which was an autoimmune disorder, initially described um, by uh, Chap Griesbach in Otago as having the cause for it as being an autoimmune disorder. So there was this girl, a uh, Rarotongan girl, very striking, and uh, then about three months later, 
I saw what I thought to be the same person. And I said, Tuara, how are you getting on? And this person gave no response at all. And it was her identical twin sister with Marcinia Gravis. And the interesting thing about that was that I'd go to Rarotonga and uh, do the neurology there every so often. And I saw her again. And uh, this is now 38 years after I initially saw her. And she is well, and the myasthenia has disappeared. But anyway, there it is. Autoimmune disorders crop up in odd things. And recently, there have been described a, a number of autoimmune disorders affecting different parts of the nervous system, which previously were just called encephalitis or some other label. But now we know that autoimmunity is involved and we can treat them appropriately. <clears throat> With Parkinson's disease, the most important uh, step forward uh, in my career was in 1972, shortly after I got back, Madhupar and Cinemet came on the market and they are really the first line treatment in this disorder still. And the medications that have come since then uh, with bromocryptine, tolcopone and various other medications, the uh, clozapine and midodrine, nothing has been as impressive as the uh, advent of Cinemet and Madhupa. Deep brain stimulation uh, is of great benefit to a very small number of selected patients. But the big step forward in Parkinson's disease is in understanding what the changes in the brain cells are in those particular areas in the substantia nigra where the brain cells are being lost. So there's been remarkable understanding there. And if you know what the, is going on with those brain cells, then there is the potential for reversing that and preventing or stopping the progression of the disease, uh, which is what the aim of the research is about. And a lot of that research is being done in both Auckland and Dunedin. In uh, stroke or epilepsy, I think I'll mention that right at the end in the interest of time. Video monitoring is uh, an important part that has come in since I was first started in neurology. Stroke, the, um, the management of stroke has been uh, revolutionized by the advent of the CT and MR so that we can make an accurate diagnosis without doing terrible things to the patient. And their clot-busting medications are increasingly effective. And this is uh, now practiced in all main centers. So, but the problem with that is that you need the patient there, preferably within three hours and certainly within four and a half hours. Um, and uh, it only applies to a relatively limited number of patients with uh, an ischemic stroke and um, probably not more than 15% of patients can be treated in this way. Um, reviews have shown so about three years ago that less than 5% of patients were being treated and now it's most centres are treating more than 12%. So while the treatments improved, it's not dramatic. And the dramatic change in stroke, from my point of view, has been that it's become much less frequent. I used to see a lot of men, particularly in their late 40s and 50s, with bad strokes and terrible cor coronary ather atherosclerotic disease as well. And that has diminished dramatically. And I think probably smoking is a large part to do with it. And the treat effective treatment of hypertension is, and effect moderately effective treatment of diabetes is the other. So it's the prevention that has made the big difference over the last 45 years in stroke rather than any other change. 
Now, I think this is the uh, most important change that's occurred uh, over my professional career. When I went, started neurology, um, it was an inpatient uh, specialty, fairly big outpatients as well, with the management of continuing disorders like headache and epilepsy, but a lot of patients, and uh, I had um, 22 neurological beds when at the New Auckland, City, Auckland Hospital, and the investigations were pretty nasty. To get an idea of what was going on in, inside the head, we could either inject the artery directly, putting a needle into the carotid artery, or sometimes the vertebral artery, and injecting dye, which patients said like it was felt like having molten lead poured over their skull. Or the other way was to, even more barbaric, was to do a lumbar puncture and put air in and bubble the air inside the head, turn the patient upside down and show up all the uh, fluid containing spaces in the brain, an air and cephalogram. And, um, and that was particularly unpleasant. And then to show up the spinal cord, we had to do a lumbar puncture and put dye in and run the dye up and down to see what the spinal cord was doing. And all of these were inpatient procedures. So that what has changed is that we've got other ways of looking at the nervous system. And what's happened to neurology? They've got in Auckland City Hospital, there are now 15 neurologists, not three when I started, and they've got 12 beds. Right? So it's neurology has become an outpatient specialty, and the people who benefit from that are the patients. So I'll take you through some of these uh, neuroimaging techniques. The computerized tomographic scans, so that the, came out in 1968. And at that stage, computer had some mysticism, so they were called computerized. And a tomogram is just a cut. And these scans were like cutting through the brain and giving a picture of brain slices. So that's why it got the name CT scans. And um, in 1972, it was shown that they were effective, and the Auckland Hospital Board made a response to the neurologists and neurosurgeons that, no, we're not getting that. It is just a toy. And the public subscription then bought CT scanners all around the country. But, and it continues to have a big place. The MR scans, magnetic resonance scans or magnetic resonance imaging, will be the main part of this next section of uh, slides. And I'll just briefly mention the positron emission tomographic scans, which really showed great promise of um, giving us insights in the ner into the nervous system. And uh, what happens is that a radioactive isotope, and in this case it's radioactive fluorine labeled DOPA, L-DOPA, so, and the radioactivity goes in and it emits positrons which are then detected by a couple of hundred detectors over the skull. So you need a cyclotron to produce the short-acting radioactivity, you need a team of physicists, you need doctors and you need radiologists. So it's very expensive and PET scanning now really its place is in uh, the assessment of malignant disease with spread of, spread of cancers in the body. It's 
very good at detecting those, but it hasn't any place in ordinary clinical neurology. But I show you this picture because it's such a beautiful picture. This is the, a cut through the head, about through the middle, with the front and the back, and in the normal person, this radioactive fluorodopa is taken up into all these groups, these nerve cells at the base of the brain. And in Parkinson's disease, there's about a tenth of the amount that was taken up here. And this was dramatic finding at the time. And it was also impressive that when they did the embryonic Stem, uh, embryonic stem cell implants that the fluorodopa uptake went up correlating with the patient's improvement. Uh, but that's really research. Now, MR scanning uh, came in in the early 1990s and has had a huge impact on clinical neurology in a number of ways. Now, again, the scans, MR scans, can be done in any plane. They can be done across so that you get this sort of picture, or this plane, or vertical plane. So you can do the, the scans in all planes, and you can do them at, uh, generally, it's four millimeter slices. So you get, say, f 50 slices in a single scan, starting at, starting at the bottom, going up to the top. So here's, just to show you the detail that we can get, is that obviously this is a cut through both eyes, and the black here is the wall of the eye. The white is all mainly fluid-containing uh, material in the eye, and there's the lens. Here are the muscles, the dark ones that move the eye, and going from the back of the eye is the nerve that takes the messages back into the brain. And this part here, this white, is in fact fat, and you can see that there's quite a lot of fat in the scalp. Then coming to the brain, this is the front of the temporal lobe, and the fluid is the spinal fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid, over the surface of the brain. And you can see the foldings, and here's the brain cortex, which is slightly lighter, about five millimeters thick, and folded, and the dark part is the white matter, or the nerve fibers, and the nerve fibers take the messages from those nerve cells to other parts of the brain. And you can see here's a section, this is an artery, and it's been cut across, so you can see arteries. Here's a nerve going across from the brain through the spinal fluid, and you can see other small arteries. So that this, you can see things down to about a millimeter. So it's absolutely exquisite getting detailed pictures of the brain. And you'll see, but it's not just one technique, you can do other techniques. And one of the other things you can do is to inject contrast and then take a film, and then you see all the veins. Here's the whole head, the nose and the lips, chin, and blood from the surface of the brain goes up in these things, and it's collected in this big vein here, which goes all the way down, around, and down the jugular vein, down to the heart. And blood from the inner deep part of the brain goes down these ones here, collected in here, going around here, to there, down there, and out. So there we see the MR scanning showing up the veins in great detail. So if you can show up the veins, you can always show up the arteries as well. And this is about the base of the skull here. 
and one side and the other and the top of the head is here so that you're looking straight on to the patient's face basically. And here are the main arteries that go up to the brain, these are the carotid arteries. And I want you to remember, whoops, my thumb's too big, I'm no good at doing this texting. Um, I want you to remember, here's the carotid artery, here's the middle cerebral artery coming out here and out here. And you'll see this on a next but one slide. Now, when you look at a slide, you always want to look for the arrow. The radiologists put an arrow on anything that's important. And here's the arrow, and it's pointing to this outpouching of the artery occurring where it divides into three. And that is an aneurysm. And unfortunately, aneurysms can bleed, and with the first bleed, about 30% of them are fatal. So if someone's had a bleed and survives that, you really want to prevent further, further bleeds. Now, the clever neurosurgeons can get to that by opening the skull and separating it out and putting a clip across the neck of the aneurysm, and that cures it. That requires a lot of technical expertise, and uh, it's not a straightforward procedure. The other technique that's been developed, and this is the sort of thing that you know, has got spin-off from the developments in technology, is by the interventionist neuroradiologists. And this is the, really continues down from the ones that you've already, the arteries you've already seen. Here's the common carotid artery, and that's where the internal carotid artery starts and goes up there, and the external carotid goes out there to the face and scalp. So here's the internal carotid artery, and here, way down at the bottom down here is the groin, and here's the aorta, the main arteries coming out here to the arm, and that's obviously the neck and the shoulders. And the clever radiologists can put a catheter from down here in the groin, goes up the aorta, up through here, up the common carotid artery, up the internal carotid artery, up here, wiggle it around, turn the corners, put the catheter actually into the neck of that aneurysm and fill the aneurysm with platinum wire. Just extraordinary. And so there it is, it clots up, the artery, the aneurysm's fixed, and the patient hasn't had their head opened. So the advances in technology have a spin-off in neurology and neurosurgery. Now turning to stroke, these are all MR scans of the same patient, and they are different sorts of MR scans that are done an hour and a half after the stroke, and then five days after the stroke. So this is the MRA showing the arteries, and here's the middle cerebral artery on that side, and here it is blocked. And the effect of that blockage is to reduce the blood flow to a fair part of that side of the brain. Now, doing this type of scan, it shows where the, there's high accumulation of water and that part of the brain is permanently damaged by the stroke. But then five days later, after the clot-busting drugs, the artery is restored, blood flow all there is restored and they're left with a small area of damage there. And that patient made a very good recovery. So these are the sort of things that we can do in stroke, we know what's going on, and in some patients we can do something about it. 
Now turning to a different sort of problem. This is a 48 year old woman who lost the vision to the left side. She couldn't see anything to the left side of where she was looking. And here is a scan, a cut done through the head. That's the front and that's the back and one side and the other. And this side is normal with the normal spaces containing fluid in the brain and all these are normal spaces and normal fluid over the brain and you can see the convolutions and the grey matter which is slightly lighter and the white matter, the nerve fibre layer and here all of the structures have got an abnormality. It involves the cortex and the white matter. Now it doesn't fit, it could look a bit like a stroke but it's not because it doesn't fit to the territory of an artery and then a special technique was done to show up minute amounts of iron and here is the this it's a bit blurred because it's you know, a changed sort of scan and here you can see all these lots and lots of little they're micro hemorrhages, they're little hemorrhages and even some on the other side. So this patient's had little hemorrhages and now they've got a large patch of problem and she, she's got amyloid angiopathy. The small blood vessels have been infiltrated with amyloid and in the area that I showed you that's all an inflammatory response and she was treated with anti-inflammatories with some improvement but she's then got the problem of the amyloid which she could have a big hemorrhage and that sort of amyloid angiography does occur in Alzheimer's disease and I'll talk about that later on at the end. Now this is the only CAT scan I've shown and you know it's a CAT scan because the skull is shown in white and the CAT scan's fantastic at showing up ba uh, bone and blood so it's the ideal thing if someone has a head injury a CT scan's going to show you fractures in the skull and show you if there's any blood present, any hemorrhages so it's ideal, it's quick, it's easy and you can also show up the blood vessels on a CT scan and uh, it's not that CT scan is worse or better than MR scanning, they've got different uses but they're both very useful investigations. And this patient is a 42 year old man and he had lost the vision his vision had uh, went to initially noted some sort of flickering shimmering out to one side and then it spread to involve everything that he was looking at and things appeared very blurred and uh, the front half of the brain is normal and this grey matter, white matter and the dark is spinal fluid or cerebrospinal fluid in the brain and the back half is abnormal but the it's interesting if you look white matter the gray matter is pretty good but all this changes in the white matter and that is shown up in the MR scan of the same patient at the same time and you can see these odd changes which are strictly confined to the white matter and that is a, an unusual presentation of multiple sclerosis and the MR scan has really transformed our understanding of multiple sclerosis. I don't need to mention anything further because Debbie Mason is going to talk about that later today. The other area which makes it very much more comfortable for the patient rather than having dye injected into the back is the investigation of sciatica and backache and uh, here is a 
cut through the middle, from, that's the top, that's the bottom, that's the front, that's the back, and here the bodies of the vertebra, and between the each vertebra is a disc. And you see they're nicely formed, and lens shaped, and then we come down, that's L5, that's S1, the disc's gone. And where's it gone? It's gone backwards. And it's poking into the back part. And here the nerve roots coming down here. And uh, on this side, that's the vertebral body. This is cut through this way. So that's front, that's back, and that's one side and the other. And here are the nerve roots being all together. The disc material is pushing backwards and pressing on this nerve root. So that patient's got sciatica and the neurosurgeons fixed that. So there it is. You, the investigation of problems with the nervous system is done quickly and efficiently, but also painlessly. You know, this is just great now to be able to investigate patients without doing those terrible things that we did to them 45 years ago. Now, what I've shown you so far in MR scanning is the structure, you know, the anatomy, the way things relate to one another. Um, but what we really want to know about the nervous system is how it's functioning. And the MR scan can give some idea about this because when a part of the brain is functioning and the rest is relaxing, the part of the brain that's functioning has an increased blood flow. And if it's got an increased blood flow, it's got more oxyhemoglobin, gives you a higher signal, and if you use the three Tesla, that's the strength of the magnet of the MR scan, if you use three Tesla is now pretty well standard, so you can get an 8% signal difference between the active part of the brain and the inactive, and that's enough to really show up uh, things you want to see. Now the MR scanner has um, so much research potential that the psychology department in the University of Otago have asked the foundation to fund a six million dollar specified scanner for their department. And uh, the answer went back, well, no, we're not, we haven't got that much money. But it's an indication that a, there is a department that wants a dedicated MR scanner to do their research. So by doing things, you can investigate speech. So if someone is lying quietly and hearing words, then this is the part, the upper temporal lobe, that is for hearing and understanding words. Seeing is in the back half of the brain, and this is where you under, understand written words. If you actually read words, here's the much more forward, and if you are generating verbs, this is Broca's area just in front of the motor strip. So you can see that, as you'd expect, different parts of the brain are doing different things, but you can ask a whole lot of questions um, when you've got functional MR scanning. And this is a complicated slide. Uh, we'll just do the left-hand side, and this is the midline of the brain here, and that's front, and that's the back, and there's the cerebellum, the base of the brain, the temporal lobe. So we're looking from above and from the right side. So we're looking from above, from the right side, and also from behind. And this patient had epilepsy, and it was arising from a little cavernous angioma, an, a tang a an abnormality of blood vessels just there. Now what the surgeon wanted to know 
was if he operated on that, would there be any chance of uh, giving some paralysis? And so the, this is the right side of the brain, and so the, that moves the left finger, and this patient with repetitive movements of the left hand, this part of the brain lit up, the increased blood flow, which was a distance away from the cavernous angioma, so it was quite safe to operate, and in fact the patient did very well. So functional imaging is a thing of the future. Now, where do we go from here? We've seen that there have been marked changes over the 45 years. Where do we go? And uh, with the neurodegenerative changes, the major changes with those are in the understanding of what is going on with the um, mechanisms that end up with the death of the nerve cells. And that gives us the ability to change, and I think we're going to see treatment of both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease uh, within the next decade. Um, <coughs> With Alzheimer's disease, we've, uh, we've talked about mechanisms, and the genetics of Parkinson's disease um, have been well recognised. Very occasionally there are families who have a, an identifiable genetic inherited mutation that causes the disorder and generally the patients have the Alzheimer's coming on at a younger age and are different and that is un distinctly uncommon. But there are other genetic factors such as the ApoE4 allele of a gene, one, a particular variation on a gene that can predispose you, just makes it a bit more likely to happen, and one or two other genetic markers. So yes, genetics can have an effect in Alzheimer's. Amyloid remains the main um, abnormality, and this is, uh, a, a lot is now known about these the amyloid, which is an odd protein, and it starts as, an, as a soluble protein that does no damage, and then it becomes insoluble, it folds up, and when it forms that, it forms insoluble collections of amyloid in the walls of the blood vessels, outside the nerve cells, and actually inside the nerve cells, and that does you a power of no good. And the whole process of that is relatively well worked out. And as I showed you in that other slide with the multiple little hemorrhages, the amyloid can be in the walls of the artery and that can affect the blood flow and make the whole thing worse. And we know that if someone's got cerebrovascular disease then that aggravates any tendency to Alzheimer's disease. And as you saw there's a lot of inflammation in that patient with am amyloid angiopathy. Now there's already been some trials of immune therapy getting rid of the amyloid from the brain. Um, the, the, unfortunately there were bad complications and the trial had to be stopped, but at least, at least we've got a start on effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease. For cerebrovascular disease, uh, I don't see any real change occurring in the management of a stroke after it's occurred. So the whole emphasis needs to be on prevention and the prevention of and treatment of hypertension, raised cholesterol, diabetes. And then there's a group of patients that we've tended to forget about over the years, don't have ordinary strokes, but they have changes in the brain that may just progress very slowly rather than having strokes, and that's due to changes in the very small blood vessels. And that occurs 
more in Alzheimer's. And I think that is a group of patients that really we need to learn a whole lot more about. Uh, so small vessel vascular disease in the brain is something that's not talked about very much now, but I think should get a lot more attention. With epilepsy, the genetics and the um, biology that goes on from the genetics has given us a clue as to what is going on in some patients with epilepsy. But again, epilepsy isn't a single diagnosis. It's lots of different things. In fact, just about anything that goes wrong with the brain can end up with epilepsy. Uh, so that we're trying to seek out, sort it out, and find out which medications are best for which type of epilepsy and which, which types of medication are best for a specific patient. Because it's very much like the medications, you know, a bit like alcohol. Some people seem to be able to drink an awful lot and not be too affected, and other people, um, you know, a couple of drinks and they're hopeless. Um, and the same appear, appears to me in medications. You know, a few people can take a high dose of antidepressant medication. Other people, a modest dose. You know, a fifth of what those people are on, a fifth makes them zonked. So that there's a tremendous individual variation. And in epilepsy, the challenge is to suit the medication to the patient. And I think we'll be able to manage this through more studies in neuropharmacology. CNS injury, you'd think, gosh, there's nothing un new under the sun there. But we now know a lot about the, uh, initially there's a knock on the brain, there's a bit of hemorrhage, and then all sorts of secondary events occur. The brain swells. The reduction, the flow of blood to that damaged part of the brain progressively decreases. Things get worse and worse. The brain swells, and that gives problem. And it's this treatment of the secondary changes that I think is going to be most important. And treatment of brain injury, I think, is going to be much better than the treatment of stroke. And the, the idea of time is brain is most important. It's going to be very important to start treatment within American uh, football. And there, where they're wearing helmets, in fact, the helmets probably contribute to more brain damage than if they weren't wearing helmets. And uh, th some of those people end up in their later years, which looks like uh, Alzheimer's disease plus a touch of Parkinson's. The other thing is spinal cord, the uh, neural grafts. It seems as though you ne only need a relatively small number of nerve fibers to bridge a gap in the spinal cord to get the legs to move again. And I think this is going to happen in people who've had severe spinal cord injury. I think the treatment and management of that is going to be very much better in the future. So. In summary, you'll be pleased to see this. A summary always means it's the last slide. Um, there have been amazing changes in the last 45 years. And over the 45 years, the rate of change has got faster and faster. Well, I think that's true, or it might be that my brain's just getting slower and slower. But anyway, the rate of change, I think, is getting faster. And this rate of increase in knowledge, I'm sure, will accelerate. Just look at the number of people moving into neuroscience now. It's um, a hu huge change with a great prospect for the future management of the neurological problems. But the progress, as in the past, will depend on research and the research will need to be funded. But the important thing from our point of view of our community is that New Zealand will continue to make substantial contributions to this research.
you, jo thank you, John. I'm sorry we're running a bit late at the moment, so um, there won't be we won't be able to do any questions here. But perhaps if somebody has a general question, you might like to meet John outside, and he might go. Now he can't talk about individual things, but something in a general way, um, maybe just for a few minutes, because um, we've already taken up enough of his time. But thank you very much, John. It was very interesting. I always love hear hearing you talk. I've, um, I've known John for a long time too <laughs> and I used to be a nurse in another life so I can tell a lot of those changes I've seen as well and it's incredible and I think the scanning from a patient's point of view must be the best thing ever. So thank you all for coming and um, John will answer, perhaps take some questions outside because yes. we've got somebody out, people coming in at um, 11.15 so maybe if you meet him in the, if anybody has anything specific in the foyer. You could uh, speak I'm very that. happy to talk about things to anyone outside. And I'm sorry I went over time. No, it's very interesting. Thank you. <laughs>